bonehead when you're young. Uh, we can be pretty boneheaded as males. And we, we stuck stuff in there that, well, you know, like the purpose of life is winning, as we hear from one of our presidential candidates. There's something that goes into their container. The purpose of life is winning. Being number one, yes. Accolades. That's the purpose of my life, see? Uh, well, before we get too critical, let's remember these texts apply to all of us. Every one of us, including good old yours truly here. All right. A little illustration from Deepak Chopra, which I used to listen to a lot. I like him. Medical doctor. He's Hindu. He's got great spirituality. And uh, I heard this uh, in a seminar. He said... Um, Take a jar. Uh, I think in the seminar he had a great big, you know, 4,000 ounce pickle jar, you know those big ones that are filled with good spicy pickles and garlic and so on. He said, take a jar, I don't have one of those, but this I have, and put 100 flies in it. Stuff them in there. And put the lid on. And wait for, oh, a good amount of time, maybe a week. Eight days, nine, maximum ten days. And then take your hand and take the lid off. And I wonder if anybody here knows what happens to the flies. No, they're not dead. They're alive, but they ain't leaving. The lid is off and they all stay. A hundred flies, and this has been done a number of times, will stay in there. Why? Because they've made a body-mind commitment that this is their prison, whether the lid is on or off. They've got to live there. Uh, when I was in India, another one of Deepak Chopra's illustrations was confirmed to me. You know what they do to train baby elephants? They tie a rope around the little, when the elephant's small, <laughs> you know, a, a rope around his leg and then to a twig or a a very small tree and they teach that elephant to stick around when they're serving food or whatever they're going to do. When the elephant grows up and is now 60,000 times bigger than the little one, you can take a chain, a thick chain and tie it around that elephant's leg and if you tied it to a big tree he would break it in half right now but if you tie that chain <laughs> around, if you tie that uh, little rope around a small tree again, what does he do? He stays there. He's made a commitment. This is my lot in life. Whenever my leg is attached to that branch, I'm stuck. And, of course, Deepak Chopra is saying, this is what we do in life. It's the same thing as Richard Rohr says. It's the same thing that Jesus is saying. We create these containers, and unless something happens, oh, by the way, I, I failed to mention, Deepak Chopra came through with, he said, by the way, after a certain amount of time, maybe three weeks, <laughs> you've still got the 100 flies in here with a cap off, one fly will escape. And after that one fly, what happens? You know, oh, oh another one sees that, oh, two, oh, yes, four flies leave the container that they once thought was the limit of their life. Or we might say today, the limit of our spirituality. If you're trained that God is angry and that God loves to be number one among all the nations, as some of our passages in Scripture say, if you think that that's the only understanding of God, you can get trapped there. And I have hundreds of people to prove it who've come to me who've been trapped in a religion. Yes, a Christian sort of a maligned Christian understanding of who God is and they are trapped and they've left everything now. Not just the church, not just that horrible pastor and those people that proclaimed it, but also God. And we pray God that they'll come back. Well, that's part of our job as Christians is to demonstrate God is not like that, see? All right, that's all a prelude to say. These two guys, James and John, come up to Jesus. Oh, Jesus, we want you to give us anything we ask for. You know what? That, my first blush is that really? Is there no humility in any corpuscle, in any blood in your body? We want you to do whatever we ask for you. And it gets worse. Jesus says, what? 
Or oh, give us the positions of power over others. That's what the right hand and the left hand in Mediterranean culture still today means. And even in many of our corporate uh, uh, realities, uh, the most important person is next to the CEO and on the other side is the, the next most important person and so on because you know you have to have this kind of stuff in that kind of container. Rohr says in the second half of life those who mature get rid of half the stuff in their container. Stuff that sort of worked for a while. Like bullies, it'll work for a while until they finally, uh, they finally meet someone who isn't into bullies and disarms them, see? And we've got to get rid of some of the stuff in our containers. So this is not just about one presidential candidate. It's about all of us. That's what the word of God, sharper than a two-edged sword, comes and opens our own lives, see? We've always got to remember that. We always have to remember, too, that even when we're not at our best, guess who is at his best? Christ. And that's the one we live through, see? Um, oh, uh, Their need to feel important was part of the container of the shame and honor system of their day. So let's give them a little bit of a break. Uh, they were only doing, when they asked for the positions of power, what they thought, and that this is a theory of mine on my best day, would be good for all the followers of Jesus. You better have a leader, Jesus, because you might not make it. Your talk might bring you to the cross. I'm making this up. But I think it's possible. And so uh, you better have a couple of strong leaders like my, my brother and I here. You know, it could have been done for a good reason. We could fill our first life of container with things that are, we think are good for our family. Like the father who spends most of his time away from his family. He's doing that for a good reason. Don't condemn them by the way. We can talk about st stuff like that in Christ's love. They may be doing it for very good reasons, but I can tell you some of those kids had wished he stayed home more and spent more time. But it's part of his container, see? It was part of my container. I'm going to, I'm going to admit to you, my sisters and brothers, it was part of mine. And the second half of life, you look back and you go, really, was all of that the best? I mean, I know I meant it for good. But was all, or do I need to dump some stuff and take on some new stuff, see? Well, okay. They, James and John, they've already been in three years in Jesus' roving seminary, but they didn't get it. That's okay. What did I say about all of us? Okay, we're like that too. We don't get it all. Sometimes we do. Sometimes we don't. Even when we've been with Jesus in his seminary, in his teachings, in his Eucharist, yes, in his spoken words, we don't always get it. They weren't ready for the evocative, upside-down kingdom of God that Jesus brings. Here's an example. Oh, let's read it because it's worthy of reading again. When Jesus heard this, he called them together. All right, fellas. You know that among the Gentiles, their leaders, those who they recognize as their leaders, lord it over them. They like power but they, they use power in the wrong way, is what he's saying. And their great ones are tyrants over others. But it is not so among you. Whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant. So if James and John were listening, they were taking out some of their cultural assumptions from the first half of life, see? And they were realizing, Jesus is saying, take that out, it's trash, put in something new. Servanthood is greatness. The good use of power is not to dominate, not to be a bully, not to call people's names like you're in junior high still. Get rid of that stuff. Read all of us. And put in the good stuff. The love, the grace, the unconditional care of people, feeding the hungry at Peace Lutheran as you do regularly. One among many things that this good congregation does, by the way. Live in that. That container will bring you total satisfaction in life. Not, not half the stuff you put in your first one. It's okay. It feels terrible. It feels like hell to unload that first container. It really does. Because in some ways, we still like to hang on to it. You know, James and John were hanging on to that first container. Jesus said, dump that and put in servanthood. Then you'll understand the kingdom of God. And then get going. Go on. Do, it, do what I've been teaching you these three years. 
It's not so among you to dominate, you know. Um, at this point, I just want to hold up. Some of you know that our bishops wrote a statement a few weeks ago about this stuff. And uh, all of them came together of one mind, one accord. I remember that. That's not easy to do with 65 bishops, by the way. <laughs> but they did. And listen to this. I won't read the whole thing. We, the members of the Conference of Bishops of the ELCA, speak with one voice. Now think containers of our life. To condemn the hateful, deceptive, violent speech that has too readily found a place in our national discourse. And they're talking about the whole game. Everybody, see. We refuse to accept the ongoing normalization of lies and deceit. He's, they're, they're talking about, there's a container that a lot of our people in the whole world are still living. They're still taking eating out of that container. We refuse it, and we recommit ourselves to speaking the truth. We pledge to be vigilant guardians of the truth. I love this because it sounds like Luther. Refusing to perpetuate lies or half-truths that further corrode the fabric of our society. We commit to rigorous fact-checking. Oh, what a novel idea. Why wasn't that? Anyway. Reject the use of humor that normalizes falsehood. We bodily, notice the word, not just thinking about it, we bodily advocate for the marginalized and oppressed. It's a container, dear Christian, that comes right out of our Christian faith and out of our Lord's mouth. And we can eat from that container and bless the world. If you eat from the other container, there ain't no blessing. And we're going to do some blessings here today of marvelous work from your hands. Your bodily expression of faith. You're doing the very thing Jesus and the bishops are talking about. I commend you. That's what it's about. By the way, um, John Dominic Crossan, who I've become a friend with over the years, he calls this first half of life container, he doesn't quite use those words, he, he calls the kind of thinking that lives on retribution and bullying and war, he calls that the normalization of civilization. And he said, and his whole, all his books are about how Jesus rejected the normalization of civilization. From the very beginning, you go back to Cain and Abel, when the civilization started, more than one person in your life is a civilization, you have to deal with it, see? Right away, what happened in that story? And ever since, part of the container that you and I were brought up with, and I'll use myself, dip into once in a while and take a little morsel of revenge. It's so sweet for a while. We take a little morsel and we feed off a, a banquet of spoiled, moldy, rotten food. And Crossan says, Jesus' whole, if you look at it through the lens of what Jesus is doing, he's saying, the normalization of civilization that you've grown up with is a bad container. I come with the what? The kingdom of God. We sing it at Christmas. You know, the kingdoms of this world have been subsumed in the kingdom of God, or a reign of God is what we're using more often now. The reign of God is one of risky Gracious, powerful love for the enemy. Yes, even the enemy. Um, living in Christ is both a beautiful thing and a scary thing. Let's not kid ourselves. But I'm here to say to you that if we aren't using that love of Christ, even in our voting, we need to take another look at that container that we're dipping into. See? Okay, how does it work? You may have heard the story. It's been around a while, but it's very powerful. Teddy Stallard was a kid who didn't do good in school. He, unfortunately, had parents that uh, were not able to parent. He came with greasy, uncombed hair. His clothes smelled. He smelled. He uh, was uh, often found with a vacant stare in his uh, face. And he was just hard to, uh, for many kids to uh, love. Okay, his teacher was Miss Thompson. Like so many teachers over the course of my vocation, I love the teachers in this world. Um, 
Anyway, this story in particular is good because it talks about the journey Miss Thompson took as a Christian with Teddy. She, by her own admission, said Teddy was very difficult to, uh, to teach. And she got very frustrated. And she said even, and I got angry and I would swear to myself. Then I'd say, God, forgive me for swearing. Then I realized it's more than swearing. I need to live differently with Ted. And she did. Uh, she should have known a little bit about Teddy. She got, you know, she got uh, clues. But she wasn't quite yet ready, see? Like all of us sometimes. We're still eating at the old trough. All right, here's what the report card said in, in uh, succinct fashion. First grade, Ted shows promise, but he has a poor home situation, so there's no follow-through. Grade two, Teddy could do better. Mother is seriously ill. He received little help at home. Grade three, Teddy's a good boy, but he's a slow learner. His mother died this year. Fourth grade, 10 years old. Teddy's very slow, but well-behaved. His father shows no interest. Well, Christmas came. Do you remember this? You brought, well, there was a day when you brought gifts to your teachers. I even brought an apple from Miss Olson, which I did not like. But a lot of the kids brought gifts this day for Miss Thompson. And they were so fun, like our kids for the children's room. They came running up to Miss Thompson's desk with their packages, many of them wrapped by their parents and really nice. And then there was one package with a crumbled up paper bag around it and scotch tape. You know whose it was? Teddy's. Teddy's gift was used brown paper, scotch tape, misspelled words, for Miss Thompson from Ted. When she opened it, out, felt, out fell a uh, very gaudy bracelet and a half-used bottle of very old perfume, which immediately filled the desk area, and they could smell it. It was rotten. And the kids started to laugh. Miss Thompson lifted up her finger. She said, stop. You know what she did? She took that perfume bottle, put it on her arm, and says, oh. Daddy, this is wonderful. Not a kid spoke. Thank you very much for the bracelet and the perfume. At the end of the day, Ted stayed behind. He walked up to his teacher. Everybody was gone. He said, Miss Thompson, Miss Thompson, you smell just like my mother. And her bracelet looks good on you, too. Well, Miss Thompson sat at the desk after he left, and tears filled her eyes. See? See? What's happening? As a partner in Christ, baptized into his container, things were coming up into her own heart and life about what she's doing with Ted. And she became a different person. Not immediately. I told you this is a good story because it's a journey. She had other days when she was very angry. But from then on, she was quite cognizant in her heart of Teddy. Now, get the best of the story. By the end of the school year, so it was many years she hadn't seen Ted, big school in a big city, um, she gets a note. Dear Miss Thompson, I wanted you to be the first to know I'll be graduating second in my class. High school. Four years later, are you ready for this? Dear Miss Thompson, they just told me I'll be graduating first in my class at the university. It's been hard, but I love it. Love Ted Stallard. Four years later, dear Miss Thompson, as of today, I am Theodore Stallard, MD. How about that? I wanted you to be the first to know that I'm getting married next month on the 27th. I want you to come and sit where my mother would have sat. Okay. What's happened? What container did Miss Thompson Yes, in a journey-esque way, not immediately and suddenly this perfect Christian, but nonetheless, wonderfully serious about the Christ container that you have in your life. And may I just commend you on this day that we're going to meet a new potential pastor here. You should hold in your heart that you have lived in Christ. I've seen it. Many times, you have moved my heart, and you should hold that in your heart. 
no matter what happens in the days, weeks, and months ahead. You've been around, dipping in each container like I've been, and you know which one feeds your soul. Yesterday is gone, tomorrow has not yet come. Live into the Christ container today. Amen.